Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Uh, be sure to follow us at, on Twitter at twitter.com slash UNC knowledge. Twitter.com slash UNC knowledge. Ask questions, send comments, suggest guests. Today's guest, Harvey C. Mansfield Jr. matriculated at Harvard in 1949 and has been there ever since. He received his bachelor's degree from Harvard in 1958, excuse me, 1953, and his doctorate from Harvard in 1961. In 1962, he joined the Harvard faculty, and today Professor Mansfield is the William R. Kennan Jr. Professor of Government at Harvard. The author of Translations and Studies of Political Philosophers from Aristotle to Burke to Machiavelli to Tocqueville, but Professor Mansfield is the author of more than a dozen books, including America's Constitutional Soul, the controversial manliness, and just out, Tocqueville in a size that anybody can take. Uh, a very short introduction to Tocqueville. Today on Uncommon Knowledge, one of the most distinguished academics in America on the state of the American Academy. Harvey, let me begin by noting that when you were asked not long ago to name your proudest achievement, you replied, and I quote you, at a certain point in my career at Harvard, I decided to raise a little hell. Close quote. Would you care to explain yourself? Oh, well. The raising of hell yeah, is your proudest achievement. The raising achievement. of hell, I, you know, I decided to have a little fun. Most professors uh, have, uh, who have tenure are very security conscious. That's a strange thing. You would think that somebody who has lifetime tenure would uh, be willing to take a few adventures. Whoop it up a little. Yeah. But uh, they don't. I think it seems to, that when you have security, you become even more obsessed about security. It isn't that it sets you free. So I decided to make use of my tenure. All right, and good. And to do that by raising hell. All right, let's raise a little hell together right now. Segment one, leanings. A few statistics. Political contributions by the faculties of several Ivy League institutions during the presidential election year of 2008. Harvard. 7% to Republican candidates, 93% to Democrats. Yale, 6% to Republicans, 94% to Democrats. My own beloved Dartmouth, apparently a bastion of conservatism with 14% to Republicans and a mere 86% to Democrats. Harvey, why is this? Why are the faculty at so many impressive institutions so monolithically to the left? They can't help it. <laughs> they, they, uh, because they see each other and live with each other and listen to each other and talk to each other. And they t all turned left uh, in, in this way in the late 60s. So you, you saw it happen. You were on the I saw it happen. Right. That's when it took place. In the late 60s, this, uh, the new left took over from liberalism. The New Left's main enemy was not conservatism. There weren't many conservatives at that time. Harvard was run by liberals of an older kind, Cold War liberals, a lot of them. And well, so, so today, this, that today, would be that yeah. would have been the, the, when you entered Harvard, the faculty would have been dominated by. I'm trying to adjust my a Cold War liberal would have been John Kennedy. That's right. Willing to uh, endorse right. the New Deal. People like that, yeah. But proud of the United States, a sense of yes. national morale, willing to That's deploy right. American force abroad. That yeah. would have been the Harvard faculty. In those and days. all of them hard graders. <laughs> we'll come to that. Yeah. All right. So, yes, that's, so that, what was, happened that then? was there. Well, at that time, they were simply taken over by the young. Some of them fought, and, they, and, and I fought with them. I was younger. But uh, most of them uh, succumbed to the um, siren call of the new left, which placed uh, the protesting youth in charge of uh, the university. They, they were taking over the, from the establishment the various institutions which had gotten us into the Vietnam War and even more were uh, um, misapplying authority and, and, uh, and, 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 and in general uh, uh, stultifying the country. That was what, what their view was. And that all of us were undemocratic because we graded people and because we uh, had, had standards and we thought that some people were smarter than others. They came after us and they in, um, invaded classrooms and, in, and 
interrupted public discussions and pushed everybody in the universities to the left. What I saw then was just how weak liberalism was in mm. its uh, because there was fundamental no fight in it. center. There was no fight. No longer did it, it was a liberal somebody who stood up for something and, uh, and stood up in defense of liberty. But it was a, a, a person who was also eager to please and also afraid of being criticized by those younger than him. At that time, they, you could say the youth and the students took over the university. That's receded somewhat. Mm -hmm. They no longer run the place. And yet, in a way, they do because uh, uh, they are... Um, they have every, tenure. Every, yeah, they, have, they don't have tenure, but they, yeah, but yes, you're right. As professors, they now have tenure. Right. Yeah. Uh, and the students come and go still, but they're, uh, they're very much, uh, very, very politicized and very much to the left. Now you so, say... So all this begins, I think, from the students. I see. And the faculty surrender to the students. Segment two, Western civilization. <clears throat> Historian Gilbert Allardyce, quote, for a time between the First World War and the campus protests of the 60s, all roads led to the Western Civ class. Classrooms filled, teachers multiplied, in the discussion sections, generations of, of teaching assistants began their apprenticeship in college instruction. Then came the collapse. As Stanford, where we're taping this program, was considering its curriculum in the 1980s, Jesse Jackson led hundreds of students in chanting, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ has got to go. The historian Victor Davis Hanson tells of giving a lecture about the history of the West and realizing about halfway through that most of the students expected him to talk about cowboys. That was what the West meant to them. <laughs> Western civilization, great books, Athens and Jerusalem, gone. What happened? Yes, I was going to add great books to your uh, uh, mentioning of the West of Western Civ. Yes, those have gone. Those are uh, those uh, books make us think, and uh, and that and that kind of history uh, presents us with the problems of our civilization. Western civilization is not one thing. It's in a way in, 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 divided against itself in a very interesting way. Uh, the most uh, important, perhaps, between uh, church and state between theology and philosophy. And uh, so Western civilization is not a civilization which has one answer, one authoritative answer to everything, but it contains within itself problems and questions. So it's much more interesting and also more powerful than other non-Western civilizations. And we've seen that they've gradually uh, watched Western civiliz civilization cover the globe and come to them and um, and force them to make uh, concessions to it. So w Western civilization is, is something wh which is f full of interest and full of questions. And so one of the aspects of this that's all I've always found puzzling is just as you say the it, to study Western. So the great books if you start with um, Homer and include the Hebrew scriptures and work your way through. It's not always a pretty picture, and moreover, the self-critique right. begins right. from the very beginning. Homer yes. is filled with in, yes. it, what we have to believe are intentionally moral amb morally ambiguous moments. Surely. You have the prophets in the Old Testament Surely. attacking the kings. Yeah. And so the openness of the civilization yeah. itself That's to right. protest from within, it's almost as though there's a yeah. very shallow notion that to study Western yeah. civilization is to come adoring in a simple-minded way to our own history, That's which right. is not the case at all. That's right. As if it were all a canon yeah. enfor enforced by some uh, sacred authority. That's certainly not true. No. Um, you have, you've written an essay back when Harvard was reconsidering its core curriculum in the 90s. You wrote an essay in which you made a number of specific recommendations. And alas, we don't have time to go all the way through your yeah. essay right now. But I'd like to, if you could give me a few sentences on each of these. You've got Western civilization is a recommendation you made for the Harvard curriculum, quote, a course that begins with Homer and ends somewhere in the vicinity of Nietzsche still makes a lot of sense. Why does it still make sense? Those are, if you go through Homer to Nietzsche mentioning, say, a dozen names, those would give you, and it read those books, those would give you the main alternatives behind our way of life today. 
And so in, in that way, those, it, it would be extremely relevant. Relevance was a demand of the late 60s, but uh, they didn't ever get to it because they were afraid of permanence. What those great books and what Western civilization courses do is open you to the permanent problems of mankind and of human nature. The questions that re return again and again. What is the good life? Mm. You know? Is it a good thing to be ambitious? Or is it, uh, in general, a bad and selfish thing to do? By the time undergraduates matriculate at Harvard, that one's already been answered. <laughs> uh, religion, quote, religion should not only be present but central in our curriculum. Well, uh, it's central in the lives of billions and billions of people, and it's also a central question in our, our society and, again, in our Western history. Mm. So would, uh, do we live under God, or are we uh, left to our own devices to do what we wish or what we think right? Uh, what is the need for authority? What kind of God exists if there is a God? All these are the um, absolutely central questions, and we see it even in our time or in our age of science. Science cannot defend itself. Science doesn't have answers to the big questions that religion faces and attempts to answer. The military, quote, this is hardly taught at all, close quote. It's amazing. Uh, for example, in my department of political scientists, a lot of them study civic engagement, the lack of civic engagement. Our society is too individualistic, too selfish. How do we get together? It never occurs to them that a person who volunteers to serve in the military is engaged in civic engagement. Mm -hmm. They think that it's all a matter of, uh, well, to cite President Obama, community organizing. Right. You know, getting people together or holding hands while we pretend to tolerate each other. America, quote, far too little is taught about America at Harvard. We're much too apologetic about America. We are uh, embarrassed that America is as powerful and as prominent as it uh, seems to be, and there's a considerable doubt that we deserve to be in that place. Uh, well, all right, let's look at the facts. How did we get to where we are? That would be one, one big question that uh, undergraduate students ought to consider when it's their own country involved. Segment three, Harvey C for C minus. Mansfield. <clears throat> I'm told by some of your former students that, that you did, you earned that nickname. A statistic and a quotation. Here's the statistic. In 1950, about one-sixth of the students in any given course at Harvard received a grade of B plus or higher, a sixth. By 2007, more than half received a minus or higher. Here's the quotation. Harvey Mansfield, quote, there is something inappropriate, almost sick, in the spectacle of mature adults showering young people with unbelievable praise, close quote. Sick? Explain yourself. It's passing strange. That's a kind of sick. <laughs> that uh, professors who have devoted their lives to uh, their field should be so quick to find excellence in so many students. It just doesn't make sense that 50% uh, of a Harvard class can, be f uh, um, can receive an A or A minus. And yet that's what our average is. That's what our average is. Now, you have famously introduced your own antidote yeah. to grade inflation. Would you explain to us how ironic grading works? Well, I decided to give my students two grades. One is uh, the one that uh, it goes to the registrar. That's the ironic grade, and that's based on the Harvard average. And the other one is a private grade from me to them, telling them what they really deserve. And this sort of, it's a way of uh, showing my contempt for the great inflation that we have 
at Harvard now, and, and, and is not just at Harvard, obviously, but all, all, all American universities. And at, on the other hand, not punishing my own students for taking my course. I've talked to a number of your former students, and it's the grade that comes from you that matters to them. They do, they do appreciate it. Now, uh, how many professors at Harvard have followed your example, giving real grades, even if only privately? Uh, I don't know. I, don't, I haven't heard of any. You are un not but, aware of any? Yeah, not right, aware of any. Here's another way of getting at the same kind of question. In 2004, Princeton decided to end grade inflation, just did it. Yeah. And they imposed a rule that in no department could more than 35% of the students who took a course in that department receive A's. So they just enforced a university-wide curve. Uh, at Dartmouth, they've, taken, they've addressed the problem by printing not only the student's grade, but the median grade in the course on the transcript. So right. an A in a course where the median is A is less impressive than an A in a course where the median is B minus. Right. As far as I know, Princeton which just ended it, Dartmouth, which is struggling with it, yeah. out of eight Ivy League institutions, those are the only two to take action. What is going on? Why, why, why should it be? What is, what is, explain to me the psychology behind this collapse of grading standards. It becomes routine to give everybody high grades. It's just it's, laziness because it it's is, so easy? It, it becomes laziness. It starts off as... Uh, as a, as a point of view, a point of view namely that, uh, and this again from the late 60s, that it's uh, oppression for a professor to be in the position of a grader, of passing judgment on, on the young. We should listen to them, not instruct them, or in any way command them. Um, but th that's, but that, that principle is not really held uh, uh, any longer. It's just, f uh, th and it has fallen uh, into a routine in which it is uh, easy for professors to give high grades because students don't complain. The students like it. The parents like it. The administrators of the universities like it because the students don't, don't make a fuss. And, 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 uh, and, and the rest, employers afterwards, or graduate schools just have to make, uh, have to, just have to shift with it. Mm. Uh, segment four, gender, <clears throat> or the absence thereof. Harvey Mansfield, quote, this actually, as a parent who's writing big checks to a child in college, and all, this, is, uh, this is the one that brings tears to your eyes. Harvey Mansfield, quote, together the feminists and the left make up perhaps half the faculty the other half being moderate liberals who are afraid of the feminists rather than with them." Close quote. Let's unpack that to begin with. Distinguish the f feminists from the left. Well, those are, uh, are almost all women, obviously. <laughs> uh, and um, and, and, and they, they are on the left, but they um, are, 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 always insist on raising the question of uh, of affirmative action, or of, or of having more women, and, and and always more having more women means having more women of their kind. It doesn't mean having more conservative women or having a diversity or a variety of uh, points of view among women. No, um, but uh, so 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 but the, so their concentration is always on the woman's question, and this isn't always so with those who are more generally on the left. All right, now. This question you've just touched on, this question of diversity, diversity is the word that gets used over and over again. And you have made the point that on the government department, there are roughly 50 professors, yeah. and you have said about three conservatives. Yes. So I put to you what you already know, which is that if there were 50 professors and only three women, Harvard University would be all over that in a moment. If there were 50 professors and only three persons of color, the university yeah. would be all over that because Harvard yeah. University cares about right. ethnic and gender diversity. Mm -hmm. But 50 professors and only three conservatives shrug. Yeah. Why doesn't the university, of course Harvard is the example we're using, but what we're saying is true of university after university, why shouldn't it care most about intellectual diversity? Well, of course it should, uh, but it doesn't. These people all of a sudden go moral and saying, 
oh, you mustn't force us to make appointments on the basis of politics. So we only choose whoever is best. And if it just turns out that uh, you've got 47 liberals and three conservatives, well, that is funny, but uh, it's not really objectionable. And it isn't as if uh, you conservatives really suffer. You're uh, being conservative, you probably have more money than the rest of us. Well, um, I'll quote you again, Harvey. Quote, in my time, I think by my time you're talking about your student or early days on the faculty, women expected to be happy in life without having a career. Women are now as ambitious as men. Having a career has become their duty. How strange that the women's movement, inspired by sometime Marxists like Simone de Beauvoir and Betty Friedan, has brought about a great increase in bourgeois careerism among young women. So instead of empowering women as women, the feminist movement has instructed them to act like men. Is that correct? That's exactly correct. Well, That's exactly what its effect has been. Would I get an they, honest A for that question? Yes, you would. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And it shows up in matters of sex, too. As if feminism understands equality as sexual equality, and sexual equality means that women should be as free to be as great predators as the worst of men. And so they, 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 they look on a, a sexual license and having fun in that rather advanced way as, uh, as, as a matter of political principle. Uh, all right, from women to men. Manliness, your, your 2006 controversial book. Yeah. Um, as feminism in the academy has risen, what has happened to manliness? Well, it's, uh, uh, it's under a cloud of suspicion, to put it mildly. I, I don't think that manliness is ever in danger of disappearing. It's part of human nature, and that, I think, is where I mainly differ from the feminists. Uh, so it isn't that it's gone or disappeared, it's just that it's no longer employed it no longer is, re is regarded, field. that's right, it's those, no, those that's right. somehow is, that is on the side, yeah. Right. Um, and uh, that's an exception which is uh, strangely made. Uh, to, to please keep, the to keep, alumni, right? To please the alumni right. and uh, a few of the more rowdy males. Um, I'll quote you again, Harvey. Today we live in a gender-neutral society. It's a society in which your sex matters as little as possible. It doesn't give you your rights or your duties and certainly not your place. This is new. It hasn't been done before in human history. The gender-neutral society is really a kind of experiment. How's the experiment coming out? Well, it, it, it's hard to know because it doesn't regard itself as an experiment. It regards itself as, 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 a, as a perfectly natural development out of uh, democracy that uh, democracy has a tendency, a tendency to become more and more democratic, as Tocqueville remarked, and this is just another instance uh, among many that could be cited to um, make that point. And, and so they don't, they don't think of this as doing something strange, although uh, they are uh, 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 certainly conscious that uh, no, no other society that they can name has ever been gender neutral before, and it's, uh, there are only one or two possible uh, feminist utopias in which uh, such societies have been conceived. Uh, segment five, speech. Quoting you again, Harvey. Sensitivity is today's version of the soft despotism that Alexis de Tocqueville worried about in democracies, and it would not have surprised him that the worst of it would be found in the halls of the intellect. Let's take that one step by step. What did Tocqueville mean by soft despotism? It's democratic despotism. It's a despotism which arises from the uh, dangerous uh, individuality, or individ what he calls individualism in modern democracy. That's when people decide that they can't do anything uh, on their own with other people, that they are the victim of huge historical forces that are mindless and extremely powerful. 
And so they react by returning to their own private lives, their family, their friends, and themselves, and let government run their politics for them. Mm. So it's, uh, uh, it's a kind of despotism that r results sort of uh, automatically without being intended by anybody and works uh, through benevolent measures, big government or the immense being of government that Tocqueville refers to, is, is perfectly uh, good, uh, well intentioned mm -hmm. and doesn't mean to lord it over you, but it just ends up doing that mostly because people uh, decide to allow it to do that. How is it that sensitivity has now become a form of soft despotism? Well, sensitivity is letting other people's reactions to you decide your behavior. So in, instead of choosing to do what you think is right and then defending it, you say something or try out something or listen to other people demand something and um, r try to adapt to that. So, Instead of, when the students yeah. chant, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western yeah. Civ has got to go, and the prof yeah. professoriate, which has dedicated its life to Western civilization, says, if it has to go, it has to go. Yeah. That's sensitivity. Uh, exactly, yeah. Now, why is it that Tocqueville wouldn't have been surprised to find the worst of it in the halls of the intellect? Because it is something that begins as an intellectual proposition, the proposition that we don't really run our own lives but we are victims or puppets of large historical forces beyond our control. Mm. I'll quote you again. Being sensitive to blacks and women, we're talking about life on campus now, gave them the right to be offended when they pleased, and they were encouraged to react with indignation whenever they felt put upon. Thus, the notion of sensitivity led to less toleration rather than more. Those not tolerated were, of course, Conservatives, close yes. quote. Yeah. Less toleration rather than more. Well, because uh, it's, um, um, you, you start off by demanding toleration and then uh, understand toleration as agreeing with you or making you feel welcome or making you feel uh, uh, in, in making you feel that you agree, or that you're in agreement, the two of you. So it becomes a demand that the person who's tolerating actually uh, take measures to prevent the other fellow from uh, the person, the, the victim, <laughs> from right, feeling right. bad. And this led to the proliferation of speech codes on campuses yeah. from the 90s and early 2000s, yeah. where the notion was you shouldn't say anything that would make anyone else feel uncomfortable. How do you know it would make them feel uncomfortable? They say they're uncomfortable. Yes. And so it submerges true. the standard into a purely subjective Yeah, and encur encourages people to say, I feel uncomfortable. Right, because they, that's a way of grasping yeah, power. They pick out certain things to say. Now, for example, black students. I was once accused of saying, you people. Well, that's a phrase which is sometimes uh, used, I suppose, to refer disparagingly to a group of blacks but you people. So they pick on, that, on, that, on what they take to be sort of signals in, um, in, in other people's speech and interpret it as uh, malign, a kind of malevolence on, on the part of the speaker. Right. And so what, in the second half of that quotation, what I find so striking is that, of course, those not tolerated were, of course, conservatives. We hear over and over and over again yeah. that the reason there are more uh, people to the left in faculty than conservatives is that, well, that's just not the kind of life that attracts conservatives. They'd rather go make money on Wall Street or they'd rather go into the military. Probably not very many liberals in the military are there. So it's just the way things, p human beings sort themselves out. And in this, of course, you're saying not a bit of it. There is an active animus against conservatives on campus. Is that correct? Yes. The people who put toleration first are intolerant of those who don't put toleration first. If you have any kind of principle, 
or live, try to live by any kind of principle, then toleration is not the most important thing in your life. But by, by persuasion, or, for, or doing the right thing and persuading other people to agree with you, or at least to tolerate you. Uh, so, uh, they, they, but the, uh, the liberals have often, uh, uh, or, or typically, uh, taken um, choice as, 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 as an, and, 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 and a demand for toleration of uh, uh, infinite choice as uh, the, their principle, when in fact uh, the difficulty is which choice should you make? They'll tell you, you Harvey. Which, which, which principle should you use right. by which to? Uh, one final time, let me quote you to yourself. And he, he, I have to say, this is just outrageous for you to say this, Harvey, the way you do. <laughs> Conservatism is closer to the mission of the university than liberalism is. Conservatives are more tolerant than liberals, close quote. Now, I've asked you to explain yourself a number of times. This is one case in which I'd ask you to defend yourself. <laughs> Yes, uh, conservatives are more tolerant because conservatives don't expect that liberalism is going to disappear, whereas liberals expect that conservatism will disappear. And that's because they think that conservatism is based on superstition or prejudice, something that isn't in, uh, necessary to uh, human life and that, well, is, is, and that can easily be dispensed with. So there's no excuse, therefore, for a conservative to remain conservative. Once he's enlightened, once he's uh, seen the truth, then he'll abandon his view. But conservatives, I think, have, don't have that illusion. They, they know that there will always be the left. Right. And that uh, it will come back in one form or another, and that our, our politics consists of a kind of alternation between left and right. And, and they're more, much more tolerant of, um, of people who disagree with and them. Conservatism is closer to the mission of the university. How? Uh, I, yeah, that's because the mission of the university should be to open minds and not to close them. It should be not to be, it shouldn't declare that certain people are prejudiced and shouldn't be listened to and can be easily dismissed. That's the way of political correctness, and that's not the way of a proper university. Professor Harvey Mansfield, a Harvard man since 1953? 1949. 1949, excuse me, since matriculating, not since yeah. graduating, since 1949. The author of countless books, including Manliness and Just Out, Tocqueville, which I actually am going to put this one in my pocket and give myself a refresher course in Tocqueville on my vacation this week. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. A pleasure. We'll have to reconvene and talk about Tocqueville next time. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge and the Hoover Institution. Thanks for joining us.